Hey there. So the podcast is currently on an extended hiatus so that I can write my next book and work on some other exciting projects. But while we're away, I hope you'll enjoy this fan favorite episode from the archives. If you want brand new content to help you make peace with food and heal from diet culture, come sign up for my free weekly newsletter at christyharrison.com slash newsletter, where I answer a weekly listener question. And as always, if you join my Intuitive Eating Fundamentals course at christyharrison.com slash course, you get access to our exclusive monthly Q&A podcast where I answer all your new questions. Just go to christyharrison.com slash newsletter and christyharrison.com slash course to sign up or click the links in the episode description. Welcome to Food Psych, a podcast about intuitive eating, health at every size, body liberation, and taking down diet culture. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and I'm an anti-diet registered dietitian, certified intuitive eating counselor, and author of the book, Anti-Diet, Reclaim Your Time, Money, Well-Being, and Happiness Through Intuitive Eating, which is available wherever books are sold. Join me here every week as I interview interesting people from all different backgrounds about their paths toward peace with food in their bodies. And by the way, on this show, we bleep out diet culture stuff like weight and calorie numbers, but we don't censor swear words or other adult language, so listener discretion is advised. Hey there, welcome to episode 203 of Food Psych, our season six finale. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and today I'm talking with Catherine Metzelar, a fellow anti-diet dietitian and certified intuitive eating counselor. We discuss orthorexia in the health and wellness field, the cultural shift that made it suddenly seem cool to eliminate foods, mourning the loss of community and connection when you stop dieting, why growing up with a peaceful relationship with food does not guarantee a lifetime of immunity from diet culture, and so much more. I can't wait to share it with you in just a moment. It's a great conversation. But first, just a quick heads up that this is our season finale, and we're going to be going on hiatus for the rest of the summer, and we'll be back in September the week after Labor Day with some awesome new episodes. But meanwhile, I'm not going to leave you hanging this summer. We're going to be reposting some fan favorite episodes from the archives. So if you're new to the podcast, this is a great time to catch up on some awesome stuff you missed because I know that folks who are new to the podcast don't always go back through all of the archives and listen to everything. So you'll probably be hearing some stuff that's new for you. And if you're a longtime listener and you have heard these episodes from the archives, this is going to be a great opportunity to refresh your memory and and deepen your understanding of this anti-diet content. And of course, I'll miss you all on my hiatus, but I'll be doing some much needed self-care and just getting a little downtime and a little bit more work on my book because working on a book is never done. As I've come to realize over these last almost two years, it's going to be like, you know, probably two years straight by the time the book comes out of, of working a little bit on the book, at least a little bit on the book at all times. But it's really exciting. And you can join my email list to stay in touch with me over the summer at christyharrison.com slash email or come follow me on Instagram and Twitter at CHR1STY Harrison. That's Christy Harrison, where the first I is a one. Okay, so now I'll answer this week's listener question. It's from a listener named Kayla L who writes, I've done a lot of work on deconstructing the harmful beliefs taught to me by diet culture. I've accepted myself at my current weight, which has been stable for years now, even though I've bounced from diet to diet, hoping that something would stick and become a quote unquote lifestyle change. However, I still find myself physically uncomfortable in this bigger body. It's not that I think my thighs shouldn't rub together or that I'm a lesser human because they do. It's just that it's so uncomfortable and I don't remember this happening when I was in a smaller body. Same with my stomach that hangs over my pants now. I just don't like the way that it feels. How do I merge these two desires to have freedom with food and avoid the damaging effects of restricting, but also to want to change my body's size? I'm conflicted. Thank you for your time. So thanks, Kayla, for that great question. And before I answer, just my standard disclaimer that these answers and this podcast in general are for informational and educational purposes only and aren't a substitute for individual medical or mental health advice. 
So first of all, I just want to empathize with you for feeling that those things are physically uncomfortable, for feeling, you know, uncomfortable being in a larger body. This is so common in our society and our culture for numerous reasons. And I'll talk a little bit about those reasons in a second. But there definitely is some physical discomfort that can come along with gaining weight or being in a larger body. But the thing is, you can't permanently shrink your body through any means, right? We've talked about this a lot on the podcast. Um, I've gone into the science behind it as to why intentional weight loss doesn't work and has such an astronomically high failure rate on the order of 95 to 98% across multiple studies over many, many decades. So there's that minuscule percentage of people who can lose weight and keep it off long term, right, for more than three to five years. And that's that minuscule percentage is only two to five percent of people, right? For those folks who seemingly can keep their weight off long term or shrink their bodies long term, it's still not possible for those folks to do that without doing serious damage to their mental and physical health. And we've talked about that on the show as well, that a lot of the people who are considered, quote unquote, success stories, weight loss success stories, are doing so by incredibly disordered means that would be diagnosed as an eating disorder in someone who had started out in a smaller body, right? So, you know, really there's no way to permanently shrink your body without doing serious damage to your mental and physical health. And for the vast majority of folks, there's no way to permanently shrink your body anyway. And so that is important to keep in mind because even if you have this desire to shrink your body in order to minimize discomfort, which some of that is, I would argue, coming from diet culture, coming from internalized fat phobia, and the things that we're told about our bodies can contribute to feelings of physical discomfort, but also the way that spaces are designed in diet culture contribute to physical discomfort in larger bodies, right? Like if you can't fit into an airplane seat or you can't fit into a booth at your favorite restaurant or you can't shop at mainstream clothing stores anymore, all of that stuff is genuine oppression and is genuinely not just uncomfortable, but also painful and discriminatory and something that we as a society have to work to change. So that's fat phobia. That's both internalized fat phobia and also external fat phobia that you might be feeling from society. And that's part of the reason why people feel uncomfortable at higher weights. But there is that physical reality, right? Those things that you're talking about, like thigh chafing and your stomach hanging over your pants and things like that, that are physical realities of living in a larger body body or even just gaining some weight, maybe still living in an objectively smaller body, but having gained some weight and having your body shape change a little bit. And when it comes to those things, though, the thigh chafing, the stomach hanging over your pants, there are actually some really simple solutions to take care of those things that don't involve shrinking your body. Because like I just said, shrinking your body is not possible long term anyway, at least without creating disorder in our relationship with food and our bodies. So we got to take that off the table, right? Take weight loss out of the picture. It's not something that you're going to be able to do in order to address this physical discomfort. But you can address this physical discomfort in lots of other ways. So for things like thigh chafing, I really love little summer bike shorts, things that you can wear underneath skirts or dresses, which are made exactly for this purpose. There's brands like Thigh Society or Undersummers that make these types of little bike shorts. And they're not shapewear, which is painful and constricting and a product of diet culture. So we're not looking for things that compress the body, right, or shrink the body underneath our clothes. They're just these silky shorts that make your thighs glide past each other when they touch instead of knocking into each other and rubbing and chafing. So those are one thing that is really a simple solution. There are also thigh bands that accomplish the same thing that you can like, it's almost like a garter kind of thing that you put around your thigh, little lacy bands that do the same thing. They create like a silky sort of fabric for your thighs to glide past each other, but they don't have the fabric in the middle, like in the crotch area or around the waistband. And that can be helpful for eliminating a layer when it's really hot. So I've worn both of those things, the little silky shorts and the thigh bands. And I really like the thigh bands for when I want just like breeze to be coming in, you know, on a really, really hot day. Don't want an extra layer there. There's also ointments and powders and balms that you can swipe on your thighs at the points of chafing. So they give you that glidey feel and help keep your thighs from rubbing and creating that friction that is so painful. 
So there's a number of roundups of these types of products online, but I'll link to one that I like from BuzzFeed from a few years ago. It's pretty comprehensive and it doesn't come with any problematic commentary, which unfortunately some of the other roundups do. So we'll link to that in the show notes for this episode, which you can find at christyharrison.com slash 203 for episode 203. As for having your stomach go over your pants and cause discomfort, that's also very common and also has some really simple solutions, which include, number one, buying pants that don't dig into your belly so much, like high-waisted leggings that are comfy and not too tight and maybe don't have like an elastic waistband, but actually have sort of a more larger waistband that distributes the elasticness over a larger area. I really like this brand called Girlfriend Collective. They're original leggings, which despite being called quote unquote compressive on their website, these leggings are actually not compressive at all in my experience. And I've bought and returned many a legging over the years that was secretly shapewear because, you know, I'm not about compression. I don't want anything constricting me in my legging life. And I definitely wear leggings a lot because I work from home. I don't really need to dress up all that often. But even sometimes if I do need to dress up, I'll wear leggings under like a big sweater or something something. You know, you can dress a legging up. So that is one thing I would recommend. I have no partnership or affiliation with Girlfriend Collective. I just like their leggings a lot. I will say I wear straight sizes. So I obviously don't have experience being in a larger body and wearing those leggings. But I've heard from plus size folks that they are super comfortable in plus sizes too. And they have a really good range of plus sizes. I won't say the number here because I just make a policy of not saying sizes on my podcast. But if you go to their website, you can see that they go up to a pretty high size, that a larger larger range than most size-inclusive brands have. And again, they don't sponsor the podcast, but they totally should because I just gave Girlfriend Collective a whole lot of free advertising here. So if you're listening, Girlfriend Collective, let's talk. (laughs) Maybe you can sponsor the show. There are also lots of other size-inclusive brands that make leggings too, like Super Fit Hero. I know some of my plus-size friends like Universal Standard. And Universal Standard, by the way, also makes a lot more than just leggings. They have lots of different options, you know, dresses, pants, etc. And they're maybe the most size inclusive brand I've ever seen. So I'd recommend checking them out for comfy pant options. I will say that I'm maybe sort of assuming from the listener who asked the question being named Kayla, that they identify as a woman. I'm not sure if that's true actually or not, but there are other options, other types of clothes that also go up to larger sizes for male identified folks or people who like a more masculine look. But I would just recommend checking out different brands, looking around and seeing what's out there in options that don't have like an elastic waistband that digs into your belly or maybe a jean waistband that's really hard and constricting because getting comfy pants is totally your right. You totally deserve to be comfortable in your clothes. And I will say getting comfy pants that don't dig into your belly might also mean buying a larger size than you had previously allowed yourself to consider, right? And so that's a place where it's not just about physical discomfort, but it's also about internalized fat phobia that needs to be unpacked because that internalized fat phobia is keeping you from embracing a larger size that would actually give you more comfort, So I actually talked about this with Sonia Renee Taylor back in episode 113, which was a couple years ago now. So if you're someone who feels like you're just physically uncomfortable at a larger size, that's a really important episode to check out because we unpack what that really means, what physical discomfort actually means, and what role weight stigma and fat phobia might be playing in your assessment of physical discomfort. And another really important episode to check out for that is episode 119 with Reagan Chastain, where I discuss more of the movement and physical capability side of things like what if I have knee pain at a larger size or physical discomfort that sort of feels like it's curtailing your physical mobility and things like that. So we'll link to both of those episodes in the show notes, and you can also find them wherever you're listening to this podcast or at christyharrison.com slash 113 for that episode 113 with Sonia Renee Taylor and christyharrison.com slash 119 for the episode with Reagan Chastain. I would recommend really anyone listening to this check out those episodes actually because the idea of physical discomfort with being in a larger body or gaining weight is so tied up with weight stigma and fat phobia. And we have to really untangle what of it is coming from these diet culture beliefs that you can push back on and work to 
eradicate from your thinking and what is coming from genuine physical limitations or issues that you can solve, problems that you can solve with tools and resources like the stuff that I was just talking about with thigh chafing and with waistbands digging into the belly and stuff. So I think that's important to explore. We explored that in those two episodes. So check those out. So I hope that helps give you some resources and food for thought for dealing with this physical discomfort. And I'm wishing you greater comfort and ease in your body at exactly this size, no shrinking required. If you want to submit your own question for a chance to have it answered on an upcoming episode, you can go to christyharrison.com slash questions. That's christyharrison.com slash questions. And then if you want to ask me any question you want and have me answer it much more quickly, as in like within a month or two, you can join my online course, Intuitive Eating Fundamentals. This course is newly updated with hours of additional audio and written content, helping you break free from diet culture and really push back against diet culture beliefs and relearn intuitive eating the way we were all born knowing how to do. Plus, we've got this exclusive monthly Q&A podcast where I answer everyone's questions every month, and you can listen to hundreds more answers that I've given to other participants already, so you can work through really any and every challenge that comes up for you with intuitive eating. A participant named Sarah recently said in response to the latest Q&A, thank you so much, Christy, for answering my question. This is really a great feeling, and I feel so supported. When you join the course, you'll also get instant access to our private community forum, which is exclusively for course participants to engage with each other and get daily support from me and my team, as well as hundreds of other great folks who are really in there supporting each other on this intuitive eating path. If you're ready to break free from diet culture and reclaim the life it stole from you, you can learn more and sign up for the course at christyharrison.com slash course. That's christyharrison.com slash course. This episode is brought to you by my forthcoming book, Anti-Diet, Reclaim Your Time, Money, Well-Being, and Happiness Through Intuitive Eating. Learn more and pre-order the book now at christyharrison.com slash book. That's christyharrison.com slash book. And now without any further ado, let's go talk to Catherine Metzlar. So tell me about your relationship with food growing up. Yeah, so the best way I think I describe my relationship with food growing up is really normative. So I grew up in a household. My mom and dad got divorced when I was pretty young. I was three. And so I grew up splitting my time between my dad's house and my mom's house. But both houses were very, what I might say, food positive. So my mom was put on a diet at a really young age. And because of that, and because of her own experience and her own relationship with food, she felt like it was really important to always have a mix of all kinds of different foods. So we had, often the fridge was filled with fruit and veggies, but we also had a big drawer full of chips and different snack foods and play foods. Dinner time also was something that she always prioritized. And we had a mix of different kinds of foods there. And so there was carbohydrates and proteins and veggies and all of it felt really normative there. And also on my dad's side as well, it was a very food positive environment where food was celebrated in all its capacities. I think part of that too, in reflection, when I was thinking about my experience with food growing up was because my mom is of Italian descent and I'm Jewish on my father's side. And so both families had this celebratory nature to, to food and to gatherings. And so every time we would eat or I would eat, it was almost as if there was a celebration around it, an encouragement of the act of eating. That sounds really lovely. Yeah, it, it was. And I think Part of what also contributed to what I consider to be a normative relationship with food leading up and going through high school throughout my life was because I played sports. And I know that that can go lots of different ways for different folks. But for me, I really felt like it protected me from a lot of what was going on around me. And I say that because it was another environment where eating and fueling our bodies was encouraged. We often had team dinners together. We shared food, eating and fueling our bodies to perform in the best way possible was something that we all shared. And it wasn't about seeking to shrink our body or to be a certain size. 
And so I think that really helped me, the combination of both my home food environments and also the sports that I was playing that allowed me to see food as food and there was no morality that was involved in it. And I had access to, I guess, a combination of all different kinds of foods. That's really cool and so rare, like you said, with sports. I think it's, especially in this day and age, I think it can probably go much more in the diety direction. But when you were just mentioning that, I was thinking back to my own days of doing track in high school and we would do like carb feasts, like carbo loading before a meet. So we would like go, it was like these giant pasta dinners that people would bring different pasta dishes and have like a potluck at somebody's house. And I just think about that. We called them pasta feeds, I think. (laughs) Pasta (laughs) feed. And like, it just was, you know, I mean, so joyful, so not a thing. It was people, you know, there was obviously this belief that like, well, carbs will make you run faster or whatever. But it was very celebratory, very, you know, embracing the carbohydrate and all of its powers to fuel us instead of now this demonization of carbs that's happened since really like I graduated high school in 1999. So I think that was like right on the cusp of the age of Atkins. It was just about to turn, but it was so joyful at that point. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it very much felt that way to me. And I think I knew it at the time because we did socialize. So I, my main sports were field hockey and lacrosse, and we socialized with other sports groups as you do. And we would see the subcultures around us and the way that they were maybe restricting their intake or going on different diets. And there was a sense, I think, of pride in feeding ourselves as well, because we felt like we were doing it differently than what we were seeing of the other specifically women's sports teams that were around us at the time. That's really interesting. And what I think is important to note while all of this was happening was that while I feel like as I look back, I had a normative relationship with food, so much was happening around me that then ended up influencing me later. The best way I would describe it is almost like you can imagine preparing for a show and a stage being set, but the curtain is shut. And so you don't see everything that's going on that's being added to the stage, the way that it's being set up. And so later then, it was just about stepping onto the stage when I went off to college, that then things really started to shift. And part of, I think, the setting of the stage was that my mom, as I mentioned, grew up with a really tumultuous relationship with food. She hated her body. I actually have really vivid memories of going to dressing rooms with her when I was younger and sitting on the floor. And so I must have been, I don't know, probably seven or eight, the time when it's kind of excusable, I guess, to to be on the floor in that way. And her coming out and holding in her stomach and putting her dress on and asking me, you know, will this look okay if I hold in my stomach, put on control top pantyhose and wear high heels? And I remember being so confused at the time because it just didn't make sense to me. I wasn't really sure what she was asking, but I knew something was off and she often wouldn't take pictures together. And I watched her go on lots of different diets throughout my life. And then also to her sisters and her mother were diet obsessed. We even would joke going there for different occasions together. Like, what diet are they going to talk about this time? Because every time we would go, they'd be on a new diet, talking about how much weight they lost, how everyone should be doing it. And so I was exposed to so much of that while also existing in in the diet culture at large, even though I was, I, I had a different relationship with food at the time. And I remember, which is funny, I laugh thinking back to it, promising myself, I am never, I promise myself, I'm never going to go on a diet because of what I see around me, because of what I saw with my aunts and my mom. Wow. That is really interesting that diet culture was so pervasive. And yet your mom had this idea about food that she wanted you to have all foods and not have any food be off limits. And I think that's a really interesting thing about diet culture too, is that it's easy to sort of think that you're not dieting or to maybe truly not be dieting, but to still be absorbed or inundated with diet culture beliefs and to get those messages really from such a young age. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what made it ever more confusing much later when I thought that I was just doing the quote unquote healthy thing, when really I was completely consumed by, by diet culture. But on the surface, it was, everything looked and presented as being normal and healthy. 
Yeah. So how did it develop from there then? You said in college, that's when it started to go a little bit off the rails. Yeah, absolutely. So I went off to college and as I know many folks do, I gained some weight, which I was told that I was going to. And the, and I know you've spoken about this before, but the freshman, I don't know what they call it these days, but that's what it was at the time. And feeling like already going into college that it was something that I should be fearful of, that there was something wrong with it, then it happened. Then I did gain weight. And so the message that I had gotten was, well, this isn't something that's supposed to happen. And this is something that you you need to take care of without someone maybe necessarily overtly telling me it was I was surrounded by it. And in fact, I take that back, I guess, in some ways that when I would go off, people would make sly comments like, oh, the freshman watch out for the freshman. And so I I went after that year, I was trying to, I guess, fix that and decided to go on my first diet ever at age 19. And I went on Atkins and I was nannying that summer. So I had lots of time to spend on hyper-focusing on the diet. And that's when things went really south pretty quickly. That's when after some time on the diet, I started binging. And then throughout that whole summer, I purged as well. I was over-exercising. I was tracking my calories. I was tracking my food intake. I was hyper-obsessive about everything that was ha- had to do with my body and my food intake. And so I did lose weight that summer and then transitioned very quickly into my sophomore year. And throughout my sophomore year, I stopped using certain behaviors. So I stopped purging, but I continued to binge throughout that year, gained all the weight back. And it was a very confusing, disorienting year because I was over-exercising, still restricting and binging, and just felt a real sense of confusion and loss for how to eat, how to care for myself, all the while while being thrusted into back into college life, which is very like a cesspool of diet culture, subculture. How did you get the idea to do Atkins in the first place and those other disordered behaviors? How did that come into your mind? I think it was the popularity of Atkins at the time. Part of it was because I watched my mom go on it and other women in my life. And so I think I knew it really well. And part of it just was because very similar to maybe what we're seeing now with keto and paleo that they were just, it was an, it was a normalized diet at the time. And it felt quote unquote easier, I guess, in the moment. And I actually remember deciding to do it and feeling welcomed into this club. It was almost as if I felt welcomed into this club that I didn't know existed. I remember having conversations with my mom and her giving me tips and telling women and connecting with women about diets and what they were choosing to do and not to do. And I felt this sense of belonging, I think, in a new way. And I I really think that that's part of what kept me in it and kept me going because all of a sudden I was part of something that I wasn't able to be part of before. Even as disordered as it was, it still, it still made me feel like I was part of something that, that felt different. I completely identify with that. I actually have written about this in in my book in the introduction where I talk about kind of like how I came to do this work. And that was really something that that drew me in too, because I also had a really intuitive relationship with food growing up, thin privilege, nobody ever put me on a diet, nobody ever messed with my relationship with food. But then I went to college, I gained a little bit of weight my junior year and decided to lose weight. And then suddenly it was like, oh my God, I've unlocked this new level of like, connection with people of ways to connect especially with women and this I say in the book it's kind of like the bridge between small talk and intimacy that I never knew I needed it was a way to kind of break through break the ice with people or connect with people that you don't necessarily have as much in common with or think you have as much in common with but then you can start talking about your diet and that kind of leads to talking about real stuff you know and and talking about the diet feels real too it's like you're getting into the sort of real shit of like yeah and then you know I reacted this way or I I started binging or I'm so obsessed with food and you know you can sort of open up about these dark things or 
trade tips on how to do the diet, quote unquote, better. And of course, the compliments that you get, like it all just completely builds this, this sense of belonging and this like sort of wall around you and whoever else is there that feels so protective. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And it very much felt that way for me. All of a sudden, I was able to talk about the more intimate things that I was experiencing in a way that maybe I didn't have the language for at all because of also the stage of my life and felt like that then was a new way of connecting. But in looking back, I think too, there was, it was the illusion of it in some ways because it was also limiting because we weren't going beyond certain points when we were talking about dieting and controlling and fixing and shrinking ourselves that then, you know, I I know now, I guess the difference between real connection and intimacy and vulnerability versus I think what I thought it was or what it felt like it was at the time. Yeah, totally. That's such an important point. And I feel the same. It's, it's a false sense of connection, but it feels so real and it feels so good at the time that you sort of don't realize how much it's keeping you from true connection. Yes. And I think people maybe start to realize it when they start to step away from the diet and then they realize I'm not able to really talk to this person anymore. Or it's, it's hard for me. It feels awkward for me to like be in this group of women now or increasingly people of all genders because they're going to be talking about their diet. What am I going to do? So it it is really, I think, profoundly false, but it's just, it feels like connection at first. And I think especially too, like you said, to people in that stage of life where we haven't fully come into our own yet and having a sense of connection where we can, we feel like we can talk about our quote unquote real selves is so necessary. Yes, absolutely. And you know, I, w- as you were talking, I was thinking that part of stepping away from diet culture in this work of working towards healing, part of what was both from my experience and is that I see that when working with clients, it's so painful is losing that sense of connection with certain people of not belonging to certain groups of losing what feels like parts of your own identity that you no longer have anymore, but have had and held for some time. And so I, I can empathize tremendously with that journey and process of transition in knowing that I can say now that it is, it feels different when you connect and are vulnerable on the other side of it. I understand that that process of breaking away from it is incredibly painful. Right. Totally. It's a, it's a mourning. There's a real loss of that community that you thought you had, that sense of connection that you thought you had with people. Yeah, it is really, really painful. And I think people need support with that because trying to step away from dieting in diet culture, you sort of feel like you're losing everybody, you know? And so having a community that gets it, having other people that you can turn to and talk about anti-diet stuff and vent to about diet culture, I think is so important. Yes, I agree. How did it unfold for you from there? Yeah. So my sophomore year was fraught, as I mentioned, with just a lot of disordered behaviors and confusion. And it wasn't until I left that summer after I'd finished my sophomore year and set out to live in Spain for a year that things started to shift for me. And that was because I decided to live with a host mom and chose the option of her taking on all meals And so breakfast, we kind of helped ourselves and she would have this big platter of different kinds of fruits and muffins and things that would sit out, but she would prepare lunch and dinner for us every day. And she loved food and loved cooking. And I was learning how to speak Spanish. And I remember I have vivid memories of her singing the different ingredients in the kitchen as she was baking a pie or preparing a meal. And so I was simultaneously learning how to cook food and appreciate food from a non-diet perspective while also learning the language. And so I really feel like it saved me, at least during that time, from continuing to go down a path that I saw myself going down and and it becoming more and more disordered. And so during that year, as I learned to love and appreciate food in a different way and really had to let go, was sort of forced to because of the environment that I was in, because she she did have control over all the food and how we were cooking, I was then able to learn, at least during that time, how to re-nourish myself and how to take pleasure in food. And that's a really important point. I think 
when I was younger, food was about nourishment and I was distracted and excited. And then I went I, on my first diet and then food just became this thing that I feared. And then it wasn't until I moved to Spain that I began to reintroduce food into my life as something that could be pleasurable through her lens and then through my experience there. Yeah, that is so powerful. It's almost like you had a sort of de facto exposure therapy or, you know, food like recovery coach with you, teaching you the pleasures of food and just how to eat enough and how to take what you needed rather than making it about eating as little as possible and trying to shrink yourself. Mm hmm. Yeah. And she she was so focused on it was very important to her for us to have meals together. So it also brought an element of community to my meals in a way that I hadn't had in college, at least where dining halls were kind of chaotic and sort of felt like battlegrounds in some ways. And so that also was incredibly healing for me to then be in community and be eating together. And then also, yes, to have this personal recovery coach sort of next to me without even knowing that she was doing what she was doing that was helping me to see food and the way I nourished myself in a very different and liberating way. It's so amazing. It's lucky that you stumbled into her because I'm sure, you know, there's lots of people around the world struggle with diety stuff and, you know, it could have been just as easy maybe to stumble into a host mom who was disordered about food in her own way or a host you know, person, whoever, host parent, it was fortunate that she was so cool with food. Yeah. And I think you're right that it, she was more of the exception, partly because she loved food. I knew lots of other students at the time that were staying with other families that didn't have that same experience, not even close to it. And so I do feel, I do feel really lucky to have had it. And while it was wonderful I, while I was there, when I came back after the year, I was plunked right back into the same setting, into the same environment, into the same university. And so that was a really hard transition. And I think as we think about disordered eating or eating disorder patterns, we see them kind of ebb and flow. And I also experienced that because I had that break for a year and then was thrusted back into the same environment that I was in before. Yeah. And what was that like for you? At first, the transition was easier than I had anticipated, but with time and reconnecting to friends and being exposed to dieting and dieting behaviors, I just got sucked right back up into it. And so going into my senior year, I remember deciding to restrict my calorie intake. I was going to go on a diet because now losing weight and my body was was going to be a priority at the time in that way. And so I went on a really calorically restrictive diet, started over exercising again and lost weight throughout my senior year. And again, going unnoticed on the surface, it was just healthy behaviors and quote unquote healthy behaviors. And everyone was sort of doing the same thing. And so I, it's almost like I didn't really skip a beat. And I think that really speaks to how certain environments can really be re-triggering in that way or really promote and normalize dieting behaviors more than others. Oh, completely. Like if you had stayed in Spain and had that familial environment or when you were growing up to what you had in your relationship with food there, it seems like that wasn't, even though the risk factors were there, even though the stage was being set, the actual sort of relationship with food wasn't changing. Like you weren't having that curtain opened and the drama of diet culture starting <laughs> in your life. So it is interesting. And I, I hear that from so many people. And I had that experience myself that even if we grow up with a family who kind of helps us have and, and the privilege also to have an intuitive relationship with food for our whole childhood, or even if we have periods in our adulthood when we have that because of the environment we're in and the people we're surrounded with, eventually, you know, if we're in the wrong environment, like if we're on that diet culture stage when the curtain goes up, then it just, we're just right there in it. And so that really speaks to me to why this is such a cultural issue, why this is not just an issue of helping individuals heal, but why this is something we have to deal with at a systemic level. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And so as I continued through, through that, through my senior year and continued to be upheld as someone that 
knew what they were doing and was quote unquote healthy. I also failed to mention that I had decided to become a vegetarian at the time. And so that was sort of around the time that people began to look at me as the expert, even though I wasn't one of things, all things related to health. Were you studying nutrition at the time or how did that fit into the puzzle? I wasn't. I wasn't. It just, I think people elevated or idealized a vegetarian lifestyle, or at least the people that I was surrounded by. And so because I had some interest in foods and cooking foods, and I had had the experience of being in Spain and I was preparing foods more and I loved having dinner parties and I loved gathering people around food and the way that I was cooking, they saw that and started to get really curious. And so I think that's when things also started to shift for me that I realized I really love food and I love the preparation of food and I'm really quite interested. And I'm also noticing the accolades that I'm getting because of maybe the even the little knowledge that I have. Yeah. And the sort of different stuff too, right? I feel like it's when someone eats differently than kind of the mainstream or has a special diet, quote unquote, it does elicit this sort of response. And again, I think this is because of diet culture. It elicits almost like an awe or a reverence, like, oh, you can do that. Like you're, you have some specialized knowledge that the rest of us don't have, like teach me your ways. Oh yeah, definitely. And I think Two, part of what continued to fuel it was exactly that, continuing to restrict my caloric intake, continuing to eat cert certain kinds of quote unquote healthy foods that I, f I felt that. I felt that response from other people that I was doing something extraordinary, or at least it felt that way at the time that continued to fuel my decision to restrict more and more. And so how did that play out? I'm curious where it went from there personally, but also when your decision to become a dietitian came into the picture, because I think that's something interesting that I've talked to a lot of people about. And I know had this experience myself where personally, I was not that into food. I, I liked good food. I would have certain things on menus at different restaurants that I sought out or whatever, but I was never a real foodie. I was never someone who was driven by interest in food and, and didn't really have the kind of refined taste that I later thought I did or tried to have or whatever. I think the real serious interest in food for me and nutrition came from my own disordered relationship with food. And that just happened to be at a time when my career was early and malleable and I could shift it in the direction of food and nutrition writing and later dietetics and, you know, teaching nutrition. And so I just am curious for you, like where your interest in nutrition played into all that and how disordered eating, your own disordered eating might have sparked it. My disordered eating 100% was the inspiration for me to pursue then my master's of science in nutrition and then to become a dietitian. So what happened was senior year happened, I finished, and then I continued. Well, after that finished, I started binging again with increased frequency and I was living out of the country in Guatemala at the time came back and that's when I, it was right around the time on, well, what felt like to me on the internet that things started to shift and show up more under the guise of health. So I started having access to and reading more and more articles about, and I, I have big air quotes on my end, health, about taking out foods and the quote unquote dangers of certain food groups and the things that I should start to avoid. And so when I came back and then I actually moved to Italy soon after that to teach English as a second language. I had lots of time on my hands. I was really trying, I was in my mid twenties and was trying to sort out who am I as a young adult? Where do I want to go next? I hadn't liked my experience in traveling that I thought I was going to like and the career path that I thought I was going to go down, which was really in international development and international relations. So there was a lot of big questions that I had. And it coincided with having an interest in food, but also a lot of shifts that were happening at the time for me, at least it felt that way in our society. And so little by little, my intake became more and more restrictive under the guise of health. And I became more and more fearful of foods and really began to see my body as this clean vessel that I didn't want anything to interfere with that. So it started with food and not wanting to put anything that wasn't quote unquote clean into it. But then that also extended to household products and certain environments. 
And so while I never received a formal diagnosis at the time, and it's not even in the DSM yet anyway, so we can't even give the diagnosis, but I had orthorexia to 100%. I think if I had seen a a practitioner at the time, I would have I, I hope I would have received some sort of acknowledgement of how how much I was in the eating disorder because it was it affected all areas of my life. I was in a relationship at the time and we wouldn't go out to eat and I refused to eat at any restaurants that weren't organic and I was afraid to be in certain environments because of the potential toxins that can be in there. And so it was all it was all consuming. And all the while it was happening, I was really suffering in silence because so many of my behaviors were and still are in many ways very normalized. And so in the same way that I started to feel elevated or looked to as an expert in my undergraduate, I started to get that again, but even more so. And so I had people asking me for advice and looking at the way I was doing things. And I would also like to proselytize a lot about the harms of quote unquote harms in so many things. And so it was during that time that I, because I was under eating and because I was hyper-focused on foods and everything about them, that that's what led me to pursue and search for a program, a master's program in nutrition, because I already felt like I was an expert and wanted to be even more of an expert and show people how quote unquote amazing it was what I was doing. (laughs) Oh my God. I so identify with that. That is very much what drove me to become a dietitian as well and to get my master's in public health nutrition, which was at the time, like I'm going to help end the quote unquote obesity epidemic, you know, and the program I was in the public health nutrition program very much build itself that way too. And Oh, God. I mean, it's so interesting. And like you said, you know, it really was a cultural moment. I think it's fascinating to look at this like historically and see that there's this cultural moment at which it became cool and interesting to suddenly take things out of your diet or criticize certain foods and food groups and denigrate subtly, very subtly denigrate people who are eating them and proselytize about toxins and different foods and and different products, like you said. And that was not always the case, right? That was probably 10 or 20 years before that cultural shift happened, which I think was around like the early 2000s is sort of when it started. I think 10 or 20 years before that, if you had done that sort of thing, most environments, I mean, you know, the sort of crunchiest places in the country or the world notwithstanding, most places you would have been looked at like a jerk or a freak or, you know, like people would have sort of looked askance at you and been like, what are you even talking about? And then suddenly this this interest started happening. And I think it, it really sort of coincided with the so-called the invention of the so-called obesity epidemic and the increasing blame placed on quote unquote processed foods and fast foods like fat, the book Fast Food Nation and Michael Pollan's work and all this stuff, I think really drummed up all this fear about particular kinds of foods. And then it suddenly became like, oh my God, if you're a person who knows about what foods I shouldn't be eating or what toxins I shouldn't be exposed to, like you're cool, you're the savior, you're someone that I want to follow rather than, you know, 10 or 20 years before again, like, what are you talking about? You're really weird and I don't want to hang out with you. You know, (laughs) (laughs) Right, right. And in a culture that upholds perfectionism, what a way then to be seen as a source of authority and someone that is looked to in that way, right? Because so much of what I was doing and following too was because of that, because of my own perfectionist and people pleasing tendencies that I loved, that I felt like I was doing it just right. And everything around me was telling me the same in so many different ways. And yet no one could see that I was quite sick and suffering in plain sight. Yeah, because the people pleasing and perfectionism, I think, again, it's sort of this false sense of belonging or this false refuge, as Tara Brock would say, you know, like it's this way of feeling like you're getting the approval or the not even approval, but the connection that you need and that you that we all deserve. So it can feel like getting what you need and and actually it's driving you further and further away from true connection. Yeah, absolutely. And has us feeling quite isolated in in our own disorder as it's happening, right? Because even though 
we feel connected on some levels. It's, I remember feeling an incredible sense of, of loneliness and feeling like really there was something wrong with me because of the bit, the aforementioned bit, which was everything around me was telling me that I was doing it right. And everyone around me was telling me that, yeah, that there was nothing wrong when in fact the opposite was really true. And how did that play out for you then? Did you recognize that it was the disordered behaviors with food, the perfectionism with food and other sort of physical environmental stuff that was driving your sense of loneliness and isolation that was making you feel disconnected? Or did you not really have an awareness of it, but just a sense of like, well, I'm supposed to be doing what everyone says is the right thing. So shouldn't I feel happier? Mm. Yeah, that that has taken me many, many years to unravel. And it's something that I'm very much aware of now. But at the time, I had no idea. And it really was, I am quite grateful. And I know it isn't the case always that it happens in this way. But I'm quite grateful for the master's program that I went through, because it was the first time that I began to be challenged by the, all the things that I had read about on the internet. I took that as truth and it felt very true. And I, and I understand that now and, and can empathize with it in a way that I probably couldn't have before. But all of a sudden I was able to read, I learned how to read research. I had professors that challenged my views and viewpoints. I saw the value of all different kinds of foods and food groups. And my, my program too was very intentional. I learned later was very intentional about doing this to us and making sure that we liberalized our relationship with food and talked about privilege and access and educated us in a way that I didn't have access to or wasn't exposed to before. And so it was there that things shifted for me, that I went in with orthorexia and I really started to realize how much help I needed and at the same time was starting to liberalize my, my relationship with food because of what I was learning. Oh, that's amazing. That's such a rare thing. Where did you end up going to school? Yeah, so I went to Bastyr University, which is in Kenmore, Washington, just outside of Seattle. And I know that each program is slightly different. I I've, have friends that were in the naturopathic medicine program, and there was a more hyper-focus, it seems, on diets and elimination of foods. And there was much more fear, it seems, instilled in them. And interestingly enough, I ran into a professor of mine at a fancy conference a couple of years ago, and she had done some research around the relationship with food of those that entered the dietetics program, the Masters of Science, in comparison to those that were studying naturopathic medicine. And they saw that the disordered eating thoughts and behaviors increased over time in the naturopathic medicine students and decreased over time in their program with the masters of science and nutrition students. And so they wanted to show that part of how they were teaching was because of that. Wow. That is really amazing research to have because it's always sort of been my sense from people that I've talked with that naturopathic medicine does kind of fan the flames of that sort of orthorexic thinking about food and the feeling of the need to eliminate particular foods. And it varies across the map, I think, in dietetics programs as to whether or not they really subscribe to or just kind of give lip service to the idea that all foods fit, quote unquote, that sort of motto of the dietetics profession. I think some programs do a better job than others of really making sure people understand that. But I think that's fascinating to have that actual research to show like, yeah, I think the way that naturopathic students are being taught, at least in this one program, but I know that's a, it's a very popular, very respected naturopathic medicine program. So to know that people have sort of worsening relationships with food over time as they go through that program is kind of heartbreaking and also not that shocking. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, on now on the clinician side of things, I often see how things really shift for many of my clients. The impetus for that is often with, and I know they often have good intentions, but it's a naturopathic physician suggesting that they eliminate a certain kind of food or continue to take something out. And it's, it instills an incredible amount of fear and often only perpetuates the disordered eating that is already happening. And so I know I always operate from the assumption that everyone is doing the best that they can and that their hope is to help heal the person. But what I really see is it becoming, yeah, quite disordered over time. So 
yeah, really interesting research to see that both on the student side. And also I see it as a clinician on the other side with my clients as well. Oh, I see it all the time as well with, with my clients and with people in my online course and people who write into the podcast. It seems like most people I encounter who have orthorexia or orthorexic tendencies with food have been spurred on or, or had that triggered by a naturopathic or integrative medicine practice in some way, you know, su suggestion from a naturopathic or integrative physician who, again, I, yeah, you're so right. They're doing the best they can. They want to help people. They got into that work in order to help people. And I know we have a number of naturopathic and integrative physicians or people in that field listening to the podcast. And I think it's awesome that folks in that field are starting to educate themselves about diet culture and about the ways that their practices or their the, the sort of tradition of their field might be entangled with diet culture. And actually, Stephen Brotman, the, the doctor who coined the term orthorexia back in the 1990s, was a an integrative physician himself. I don't know if he, I think he he now sort of disavows the term integrative and is is back to being sort of more of a Western physician because of his experiences with the integrative field, if I'm not mistaken. But for a long time, as he describes in his book, Health Food Junkies, he was like very bought in and very much all about eliminating different types of foods and prescribing that to people. And his his reason for coining the term orthorexia is because he diagnosed certain people as having a food intolerance or put them on elimination diets to try to figure out what was supposedly causing a certain condition and saw their relationships with food and their sort of quality of life just unravel. And I think that's really awesome that he was able to to sort of be aware of that and to acknowledge it in his own practice. And I hope that other folks listening who are in that field can also do that self-reflection work and think about how this new form of diet culture that I call the wellness diet is showing up in their work. And I think naturopathic and integrative physicians could do an amazing job of supporting people in recovery from diet culture and in taking care of themselves in a truly holistic way, because that's what those professions are supposedly about is this true holistic health or is, is holistic health. But I think the way that the point that Stephen Brotman makes in that book and that others have subsequently made as well is that the idea of holistic or holism that is espoused by the naturopathic and integrative medicine world today really is just about the physical and really is like drilled down even sort of more granular than that to like food and eliminating particular foods or adding more of other foods and not looking at the whole person, which includes their relationship with food and their relationship with other people and their ability to just be flexible and live life. Mm -hmm. And what an interesting lens of privilege to work from as well. So if we are being granular in that way and hyper-focusing on foods and elevating some foods and not others, where is the conversation about access and kinds of foods that some people don't have? And that speaks to so many different areas of we're not including privilege in all of the discussions that we're having about health and access, one of which is the foods that we talk about. Yeah, totally. Like telling people to eat more kale or whatever it is, adding nutritional yeast or something to their food. You know, it's like <laughs> that is not something that is within the realm of possibility to folks who are lower income. And the idea of cutting out foods, even I think this goes to like mainstream diet culture as well, not just the wellness diet, but also kind of general diet culture of like calorie counting and restricting is if someone is lower income or marginally food secure or food insecure, the idea of cutting out the foods that are going to help you feel satisfied and full and keep you going longer, like the energy dense foods, the foods with lots of carbohydrates and fat and yummy salt and, you know, meats and things that are really nutritionally dense in a sense, in the sense that they give you a lot of energy bang for your buck. Telling people to cut those foods out is just completely misunderstanding the situation that they're in. You know, if someone is food insecure or has low food security, the idea to switch out your burger for a salad is just kind of laughable because what is that accomplishing? That's just going to make you hungry. That's just going to exacerbate the food insecurity and deprivation that you already feel. 
Absolutely. I remember seeing Linda Bacon speak a couple years ago at the Association for Size Diversity and Health conference that we both were at, actually. And I remember her saying and speaking to intuitive eating and saying it is intuitive, for example, for a, she gave the example, I think at the time, a woman who works two jobs, doesn't have access to food, is then given the opportunity to eat food for for half an hour that day and has two or three hamburgers in that moment and maybe some french fries that is intuitively eating because of the circumstance and because of access and because of time and privilege and all of it and so i think it's so easy to see things through our lens and it's important that we all we all zoom out i think and look at things to your point more holistically in regards to what does health actually mean. And I think the way that intuitive eating gets twisted and interpreted in diet culture, and even I would say, you know, I think the authors of the book Intuitive Eating would sort of feel the same as like at at the beginning, at the outset of their framing of intuitive eating, they were still coming through a place of diet culture. They were still steeped in diet culture in certain ways. And so the way they framed the idea of intuitive eating didn't expand the lens enough to allow for that, didn't talk about those sorts of issues. And I think for us to advance the concept of intuitive eating, and I know that Evelyn and Elise have since come a very long way since the the first edition of the book, Intuitive Eating, to the point of now working on the 25th anniversary edition, I think, of the book and really working to include more about diet culture and all these sorts of other things, that issues that come up in people's relationships with food. But I think we, we need to keep kind of pushing the conversation forward to include that, to include issues of food insecurity, food access, and also the idea that people can be struggling with food insecurity for economic reasons and also for diet culture reasons. And sometimes the same person can be struggling with both at the same time or at different times in their life. And that has a profound effect on people's relationships with food and on their feelings of safety in the world. Absolutely. And I think it's really quite interesting to think about my role or our roles as registered dietitians because we are on the forefront of being able to see that and make change. And I think I felt even with my changing in, as I progressed through my master's program and my education, the field itself is still fraught with, as you know, so much diet culture and problematic beliefs and problematic teachings that even after my program, I still had to do a lot of unraveling and challenging Because again, it's like this echo chamber of the same thing that was being repeated. And while we are seeing shifts, I think we can make a lot of change as registered dietitians. And it can feel like because we are surrounded by so many people doing it similarly that we can't do it differently when in fact we totally can. There's a different way of doing it the way that it's been done for some time. Oh, absolutely. And it's a tough road at this point. I think it's it's challenging because, I mean, as I've experienced it, as we're recording this, I recently posted something on Instagram and also sent it to my email list of this idea that inflammation is not the enemy. And I had talked about this with Julie Duffy Dillon on her podcast about PCOS and food peace. And, you know, she had this brilliant quote of without inflammation, we wouldn't be alive or something like that. I sort of riffed on that in my post and clarified that this idea that inflammation is the scourge of the modern era and everybody's being told to cut out certain foods to reduce inflammation and go on supposed anti-inflammatory diets is just not the way, you know, that this is actually another manifestation of diet culture, that the science really isn't there to support any one anti-inflammatory diet. There's actually no such thing as like a single evidence-based, agreed upon, widely agreed upon, scientifically founded anti-inflammatory diet. It's just it's just sort of a buzzword that diet culture and the wellness diet have created. And there are foods that certain foods, yeah, you know, reduce inflammation in a laboratory setting or might reduce inflammation in the human body in the short term. But we actually don't know what happens over the long term with those particular foods or with this array of foods in general that is being called anti-inflammatory and the, the definition changes depending on who's, you know, saying it or whatever. Mm. Anyway, I, I wrote this whole thing and talked about this issue in sort of a short form, but 
opened up some of these ideas. And the responses that I got from people really showed me kind of like where we're at right now in <laughs> in diet culture, where more so than when I criticize something like keto or paleo or something that's a little more obviously a diet, it's almost the same as if I criticize or critique the whole 30. You know, people just latch on and get so angry and so upset because they really believe that what they're doing and this diet that they're following is the way is healthy and it's under the guise of health and how can you possibly say that what I'm doing isn't healthy or that there isn't science behind this and that just really shows me I think how far our field has to come with this stuff that we we need to be looking at the nuances and what the research actually says and pushing it back against these very subtle incursions of diet culture into the health and wellness field, where I think the quote unquote wellness space has gotten completely co-opted by diet culture or almost completely co-opted. But if we want to ever have a hope of taking it back or helping people truly focus on their well-being, I think we need to we need to get that nuanced and to look at how like, okay, this is a way in which diet culture is getting a hold of this preliminary science and this maybe interesting, but still very early stage data and turning it into this diet and sort of mass disseminating it so that people believe this is the way, this is what we have to be doing. And it's based on such a shaky foundation. And I don't think enough people are really calling that out. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it takes at least to, to be able to call that out or to see it a an eye that can see that, right? And and I was going to say an educated eye, and I mean that in regards to what comes to mind for me or health professionals that are able to take a deep dive into to the research and actually look at, is there any validity behind what we're presenting? And if there's not, then what are we actually talking about here? I know. And I think that it's really unfortunate that people have to have so much education and ability to read research in order to cut through this stuff. Because like you said, and I had this experience too, when I was first in my orthorexia, I thought everything on the internet was gospel too. If someone had any letters after their name, or maybe not, maybe no letters after their name, but they were just seeming astute about something on a blog or a forum or something, I would take that and run with it. Or if someone linked to some sort of study that was a preliminary study in rats or in 10 middle-aged men in Israel or something like that. Like, you know, <laughs> like population that is so tiny and not generalizable to the general population. I would seize on that and be like, but it's science. Science says. And so I think, yeah, this idea of like learning how to be critical about the health and nutrition information that's out there is so important, but also there's so much privilege that has to go into being able to suss things out. Like you had to pay for and get and make time in your schedule for a master's degree in nutrition in order to learn that stuff. I had to, I'm still going to be paying this off for many, many years, decades to come. My my student loan debt that I went back to school and got a master's degree and now I'm able to read research. But nobody should have to do that actually to be able to separate the bogus stuff from reality. I agree. I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I know that there's a tremendous amount of privilege that I've experienced in many different parts of my life and throughout my life. And as it relates to education as well, and I know you've spoken to this on past episodes, but it wasn't just the master's, but also in regards to the way the dietetics profession goes, we work for someone else for a whole year and have to pay for it. It's a, it's a, it's an incredibly problematic process that I believe needs to change so that not only more people have access to it, but so we can begin to also diversify the field. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the fact that we have to work for free and then pay for it is just mind-blowing. And I don't feel like that would happen in a field that was dominated by people with more privilege, say, for example, like finance. You know, you never hear about mm -hmm. people having to, you know, finance, law, medicine. You get paid for the internships you do. You don't have to do things for free. And you certainly don't have to pay them for the privilege of working for them for free. Right. Can you imagine? I know. It's like, <laughs> what planet is the dietetics field on that it thinks that's okay? And that we all kind of go along with it. Like, you know, I mean, there's no other way really to become a dietitian. So you have to do it, but it's, ugh, it's terrible. Yes. 
So how did you get from that place of finishing school and sort of having a, a certain baseline of maybe pushback against the orthorexia to getting to a place of, of full recovery or of having your eyes completely open to diet culture? Yeah, it took it took many years. On my end, I pursued therapy very seriously and got a lot of support around that. I continued to read and expose myself to different anti-diet books, some of which were intuitive eating and health at every size, but there's also other books that I was reading at the time and began to expand my world in a way that I had access to because I was shown those books or those tools, or at least the entryway into a world that could be different. And so I continued to do my own work and get my own support while also educating and reading as I went through my internship and then transitioned to, I was working for a health company at the time in downtown Seattle and was really straddling the fence. I fundamentally believed in intuitive eating and became an intuitive eating certified practitioner and was haze and felt like maybe I could make a difference in that company. Maybe I could teach them how to see people and see bodies and see health in a different way. And so I was trying to operate in an environment that was incredibly fat phobic and not haze at all. And so it was in working there that I too continued to learn maybe where there were areas of opportunity for me to continue to learn and expand and admit that I didn't know everything and that I still make mistakes. And I realized after a couple of years that I couldn't straddle the fence anymore. It was, it fundamentally opposed my stance morally of how we should treat people. And so that's when I decided to transition and start my own private practice so that I could run it in a way that I could completely get behind and help people work towards healing in a way that I didn't feel like I had access to and wasn't really allowed to in my previous career. Yeah, I think it's so challenging to straddle that fence, like you said, or the environments where it's just diet culture is baked in to the way that they practice. It can be really hard to move the needle. And I think people can try valiantly. And of course, we need like work experience when we first come out of dietetics schools and programs. So I think it makes total sense to work for someone else to get that experience. But then at a certain point, starting a private practice sometimes seems like the only option for being able to really work in the way that you want to. Yeah. And I'm also really grateful for that experience in retrospect, because I was able to see over time the deep suffering that all of my clients were experiencing that maybe didn't have a formal diagnosis of an eating disorder and maybe on paper or on surface, they just wanted to be healthy, but was able to hear over and over again their own disordered behaviors or how chronic dieting was affecting their relationships with both themselves and with others. And I learned that this is where I need to be. This is where people need support. They don't need more information about what they quote should and shouldn't be eating or how they should and shouldn't be moving. What's broken here and is not being seen is their relationship with food and their relationship with their body. And that is what was often being ignored and kind of pushed under the rug in the name of health and being able to present on the surface as quote unquote healthy. Oh, that is so well said. And so, so what I see in my practice and just people walking around in the world too, is this sort of mass disorder and mass distress in our relationships with food and trying to sweep it under the rug or get it under control, quote unquote, through the practice of supposed health and wellness that actually is just worsening the disorder. Absolutely. And it's awesome that you you've had that experience yourself of coming back from that and learning that there is another way to relate to food and your body. And now you can help offer that to your clients as well. Yeah. It's almost like we might call it diet cultureitis or <laughs> sort of the infection of diet culture that, you know, sometimes can go unseen and yet lots of people are, are suffering. Yeah. And then we try to do more of the same in order to cure it. It's like adding more of the thing that already made us sick. Oh, yes. Well, I'm so glad you're doing the work that you're doing out in the world. And can you tell us where people can find you and learn more about your work and also your new venture, your new YouTube channel that I'm excited to hear more about? Yeah, absolutely. 
folks can find me on my website. I own Brave Space Nutrition. And so it's just bravespacenutrition.com. I'm also on Instagram and spend a lot of my time there. So my handle is Brave Space Nutrition. And then very shortly, I'll be starting my YouTube channel. And you'll be able to go there to find content about diet culture and intuitive eating and mindfulness and perfectionism and all the things that you will see I often talk about on Instagram, but putting that into video content because I think it's a real space that is more of this information is needed. It's very saturated with diets and diet culture. And so I feel really excited to expand in that space. I think it's so great. And and we were talking a little bit off mic about how few people in the anti-diet space are actually YouTubing as opposed to on podcasts or in blogs. And so I think it's really awesome that you're bringing this information and your perspective into this forum that is so saturated with diet culture BS. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. We were saying that often So many people now go to YouTube as a information source and there's so much misinformation out there that I'd like to really offer some neutrality and some real substantial information that people can access and learn from in a way that I think isn't quite there yet or there's real room for more of it. Well, this sounds so amazing. I'm so excited to hear or see. I'm, I'm such an audio person, so I always use like auditory metaphors for things, but I'm so excited to <laughs> see what you do with your YouTube channel and really, really psyched to share it with the listeners too. So we'll put links to that in the show notes once it's available and then links to your website as well. I'm sure they can get, they can find everything you're doing from there too. Yes, absolutely. I'm really excited for it as well. Well, thank you so much for being here and sharing your story. It was lovely to talk with you. Thank you for having me, Christy. It was a pleasure. So that's our show. And that is a wrap on season six. Thanks again so much to Catherine Metzelar for joining us on this episode. And thanks to you for listening. If you've gotten something out of this podcast, please take a moment to subscribe and review it in your podcast provider of choice. That helps new listeners to discover it and helps us rise up in the podcast rankings. Just go to christyharrison.com slash subscribe to see all the places where you can do that. That's christyharrison.com slash subscribe. If you're looking for some guidance on your own anti-diet path, grab my free audio guide, Seven Simple Strategies for Finding Peace and Freedom with Food. Just go to christyharrison.com slash strategies to get it. That's christyharrison.com slash strategies. To get full show notes from this episode, including all the resources we mentioned, plus a full transcript, head over to christyharrison.com slash 203. That's christyharrison.com slash 203. And to get the transcript, just scroll down to the bottom of the page and enter your email address. This episode was brought to you by my online course, Intuitive Eating Fundamentals. If you're ready to make peace with food, break free from diet culture, and reclaim the life it stole from you, you can learn more and sign up at christyharrison.com slash course. That's christyharrison.com slash course. A big thanks to our editor and engineer, Mike Lalonde, our community and content associate, Kimmy Singh, and our administrative assistant, Julianne Watasek, for helping me out with all the moving parts that go into producing this show every week. Our album art was photographed by Abby Moore Photography and designed by Meredith Noble. And our theme song was written and performed by Carolyn Pennypacker Riggs. Thanks again for listening. And until next time, stay psyched. Mm-hmm.